Good afternoon. It's been a fun day today so far, at least a half day so far. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about technology commercialization, but really from the perspective of what I at least think is necessary in the 21st century, both from a high-level economic perspective as well as from a venture capital perspective. I am, for lack of a better word, a venture capitalist. I invest money. Um, but as you will see, a very different venture capitalist than what's traditionally out there. So if we want to talk about the future of the innovation economy, we really talk about the past a little bit. So the traditional equation defined by Marx in the old days of the economy sort of goes like this, right? You take manual labor or maybe semi-automated labor and you apply it to raw material and you know, you add some things that Marx calls the means of production, but basically you get a product and that's a, it's a very physical equation, right? This has governed our reality for the last few thousand years where, you know, we have sort of physical people, touch physical stuff, build physical things and um, that's nice. The problem is it starts to break down and with technological advancement in two key areas, in fact in both key areas that define this equation. First of all, we've seen a massive increase in productivity, that's the red curve there, uh, leading to a massive reduction in the use, the utility of labor, right? If anything, we should be working about 20-hour weeks by now if you project that dotted line forward from the 8th century. We've done something wrong. Somewhere in the 60s, somebody convinced us to work without being productive. Um, that's the only explanation, because if you solve the equation of sort of, you know, productivity per hour, hours worked, equals GDP, there's a kink there. It just doesn't work. Uh, so there, I, I believe there's a whole bunch of professions that just sort of do something that doesn't really do anything. Um, but, you know, that trend, little hiccups aside, that trend is irreversible, right? Every time technology destroys some manual labor activity, it, it isn't going to come back, right? We have this quaint notion that, yeah, yeah, but the guy who assembled the cars can now be, be the engineer that built the car. Not really. A hundred guys that assembled the cars might become one engineer that designs the car. The rest is done by robots and other fancy technological advancement. So, Labor, you know, isn't what it used to be. Similarly, the means of production in the vaunted world of Karl Marx was basically, you need to have a lot of capital and you need a big factory and then you can build product. Well, now we have things like crowdfunding taking over more and more the role of capital. Right? We still have venture capital, but now instead of writing $500 million checks to get the next big thing off the ground, it's more, you know, writing a $500,000 check to get the next Kickstarter going, which provides the capital to manufacture the goods that you want. Similarly, techniques like additive manufacturing and proto you know, rapid prototyping and the whole ecosystem of cloud-based services and so forth replace the factory. You no longer lead this giant plant. If at best you're sort of sharing a piece of that plant by providing, you know, having your Kickstarter stuff shipped over to China at some design file and coming back as products, so both labor and the means of production are losing their, their hold on the economic equation. And so instead, the economic equation that I would like to propose for the 21st century goes something like that. You take visionary entrepreneurs, they have ideas or they source ideas and they connect with ideas, and what comes out of it is an innovation economy that might very well lead to physical products or digital products, but the ratios all are wrong, right? You have a very small number of people who can have the ideas and insights that replace hundreds of laborers, hundreds of people doing stuff. And ideas, more than anything, become the currency. It's no longer enough for a company to have access to a big factory, a company actually needs to innovate. And if that's true, then it puts an interesting challenge on those companies. Right? What you see on the bottom there, well, I should point up there, what you see on the top bottom there, um, the is the share price of the top 10 consumer electronics companies over the last five years, right? So these are giants of industry. These 10 companies, you know, between them slice up a close to a trillion dollar market. And you can clearly see that there's winners and losers. In fact, this is almost like I faked the numbers, right? These are, these are real figures. There's two winners, and if Apple were in a closed ecosystem, there would be one winner, I can guarantee you this. There is one or two big winners Everybody else is a dramatic loser, and in fact, the only ones that hold steady, Microsoft and Google, aren't really consumer electronics companies. They're you know, a op monopolistic operating system and a monopolistic search engine company, effectively. So they don't really count. The point is that innovation has become the one way how companies can competitively differentiate themselves from everybody else. Right? It used to be 
that you can be the third largest mobile phone maker and be very competitive because you had your niche, your local market, your specialized supply chain, maybe your specialized market. You could be all this. Well, now that means you're Nokia, and you know, that's suicide territory for a CEO up there. Right? This, is, this is the modern economy. This is what happens if you don't innovate. The good news is that countries like Canada have an unfair share of the sort of driving forces, if you want, for innovation, right? There is 9,000 universities in the world and lots of students and you know, lots of faculty members and academia is sort of this hotbed of innovation where new ideas come every minute, every day. And Canada has a lot more per capita in terms of universities and students than pretty much all the countries on the planet. You know, there's a few other European countries that have similar density, but we are right there and this is great. Like we are perfectly positioned as a country to be a leader in this new innovation economy. Except, none of that stuff makes it out. That's the big problem of, you know, if you're from my world, people call that the technology transfer gap. But really, it's very easy to illustrate what's, what's not working, right? You have, uh, take the US and Canada. The US and Canada have spent about $54 billion last year, actually two years ago now, in university applied research. So we're not talking about the arts and theater and those kind of things, applied research, stuff that happens in engineering schools where people presumably wrote a grant application that said something like, you know, give me money, I'll do this stuff and it will have this benefit to the economy or this benefit to Canada, right? Really applied stuff that is supposed to go somewhere. $54 billion. What has come out of those $54 billion is less than 600 startups. Now, 600 startups sounds like a big deal, but that's something like $30 million per startup. You give me $30 million, I'll build you a couple companies. It doesn't even mean successful startups, right? Just, just any startups, right? So you're multiple orders of magnitude off, and this being an efficient system. And, and yeah, you can talk about, well, this doesn't count everything. And, but this data is from the Association of University Technology Transfer Managers, which is the union of the people in charge of doing this. So if there's any bias, I would suspect it's bias in the direction of being positive about the numbers. So if we have that problem, what can we do about it? Well, we can start to think about the innovation economy and our academic systems as a mechanism for massive wealth generation. Look at the bar at the bottom. More or less the entire US economy, at least the stuff that will survive in the 21st century, is based on the R&D output of those $16 billion spent on research in companies. Right? That's, that's the stuff that builds the industrial future. But for every dollar that is efficiently leveraged in industrial R&D, there's five dollars in academic and pseudo-academic government funded, like national apps kind of stuff, that has a two order of magnitude lower conversion rate into useful output. That's a horror story, but at the same time, that's a massive opportunity to build wealth and growth in a country like Canada that has such a profound academic foundation and the need for startups. We heard the whole morning about building brand, about building opportunities. Well, part of that is to bring these ideas into the commercialization phase. So just to recap, in the 21st century economy, at least the way I think of it, you have this sort of synergistic interplay between technology, innovation, technology transfer to get it out, and entrepreneurship as the mechanism, really, to take these ideas from a very theoretical setting into a very applied and commercial setting where it actually generates measurable GDP for us as a society. So then the question is, what's our role as venture capitalists, right? How does that change? What's a 21st century venture capitalist supposed to do? Well, I don't know exactly what we're supposed to do in this century, but I can tell you that doing what we did last century isn't gonna work, right? Because that's the graph from last century. You see the VC industry as an asset class sort of happily ticking along you know, delivering 20, 30% internal rate of return, and then boom, come the turn of the century and the bubble, and it just never recovers again. Right? This is a decade worth of data of failure as an asset class. We as an asset class, all of us have failed collectively. That's bad. That's bad because the country sort of relies on this asset class to, to create the kind of commercialization engine that can keep our status of living and, and, and you know, drive the economy. So what do you do if something like this doesn't work? Well, you, you zoom in and try to figure out, well, maybe not everybody is in trouble. Maybe there are some players that are working. So the Kaufman Foundation recently did this, well, about a year ago. And what they had done there is they've graphed uh, on, that, on that bar chart in the bottom, 
the return of their 147 uh, venture capital funds that they've been in LP in, in the last uh, 20 years or so. And what you can see is about half of them, the red ones, lose money, and so those are more or less hopeless. Uh, the one third, the black ones, they make money, uh, you know, but, but not enough to beat, in this case, the, the, the Russell 2000, which is basically an index fund. So if you, you know, if as an asset class that's supposed to be high risk and you don't even beat sort of a blue chip stock market, then, you know, you probably should have advised your LPs to just put the money in the mattress. And there is a tiny handful of funds. That's the good news. There's these few funds on the right there in the blue that actually are doing what they're supposed to do, which is multiplying capital for their limited partners. And so when you look in, like that very smart fellow from Harvard Business School did, when you look at what those funds have in common, well, there's really three things. The first thing they have in common is that unlike funds of the last century, they actually understand their domain. They're specialized in a particular field, and in that field they have a profound knowledge of the market, of the technology, of the players, of the industry, of every aspect of that domain. And that matters. That matters because in the 19th century, venture capital financing was about providing capital, and so having people with financial backgrounds making efficient capital allocation decisions was the right way to go about it. With capital becoming less and less of a driving concern for, for startups, expertise becomes a bigger, you know, bigger element. Just, these two go hand in hand. And so the ability to actually understand what you're doing in the domain that you're investing in becomes a critical feature of a VC fund. And we see this consistently that the funds that have that expertise and focus on a narrow sector outperform the ones that spread their wealth globally. The next thing we see, again driven by data, is that the ability to provide operational assistance, value add to your startups, is more impactful and more powerful and more correlated to your return as a fund than ever in history, at least ever in history that anybody tracked this data. And that again, I believe, is for exactly the same reason. It used to be that your value add principally was the check you wrote, right? You provided the capital, allowed people to build the stuff and sell it and so forth. So now that that is sort of a second tier activity, you need to provide other things to your companies that help them succeed in this globally competitive marketplace. One of the funds that does this really well, Andreessen Horowitz, they just raised another big round. And I was, uh, yesterday night, I was on their website and I was counting on their team list. They have 68 non-investment staff in their fund. 68 people that have nothing else to do all day but to help their portfolio companies with marketing, data analysis, technical services, hiring, coaching, recruiting, and so forth. The day that a fund is three partners and an admin assistant are over. If your fund cannot provide operational assistance to your portfolio companies, then you're just a bank. And banks need to deliver better returns than what we see here. Either way, you're out of business. So if you bring these things together, if you have operational capability to add value, and if you understand your market, then you can do the third thing, actually the biggest thing that every analyst that looked at this data has found is the biggest sort of correlation to high return, and that's investing in high technology risk. When Silicon Valley started, when it became the Silicon part of Silicon Valley, the VC community, the budding sort of world that invested in the Fairchild and so forth, they took massive technical risk. Very little market risk, because the notion was, well, this is incredibly hard to build, but if we build it, people want this, right? That's what sophisticated, technologically savvy and operationally you know, capable VCs can do, because they can assess the technology, assess the risk, and make hard calls on the technology side. If you lack those skills, you end up making, risk, making investments that basically have market risk. Market risk kills companies, right? This should be very obvious. If you, if you build something that is really hard and you build a team that cracks the nut, not only do you have a competitive advantage, but if it's difficult, it also means you can solve it through strategies like hiring smarter people, hiring more people, showing engineers at the problem and so forth. If you take market risk, basically people don't buy your stuff, that's the negative outcome. There's just nothing you can do other than cry in a corner. Market risk kills companies and therefore makes for bad investments. Take deep technological risk, but to do that you need to understand what you're doing. So bringing all this together, I believe 21st century VCs should understand what they're doing in their domain, invest heavily in technology, have operational value add, and again, have this sort of synergistic construct between the three, because you can't do these things without having all three elements. At Tandem Launch, I'll talk for one slide about what we do for a living. 
At Tunnel Launch, we tried to do that by being basically a turnkey service for our entire ecosystem. So we work with industry partners, the Sonys and Samsungs of the world, very closely to identify technology problems that are on their five to 10 year roadmap, hard stuff that they themselves can't solve, or at least are looking for others to solve. We then turn around to hundreds of universities in our network, solve those problems. They actually, not we, they solve those problems. Take those ideas, put them into startups by incubating them, really with a complete operational cocoon where the only thing the entrepreneurs and inventors have to do is actually create a market and build a product. When those startups come out, which is not that easy, that minor detail, um, <laughs> but, but if they do that, we then finance those startups to so take them up to scale, bring them to the next level, bring them back to our industry partners, and hopefully com complete the circle that then gets our industry partners to come back to us. In other words, we basically build synthetic companies around innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, this is just one example, I won't go into detail, but here's a company that we built from scratch, from an idea out of London, with an entrepreneur out of Vancouver, with a business team out of Montreal, with an engineering guy out of New York. We put this together completely synthetically. None of these guys were even on the same continent for most of the time. Merged the company and gone from solving the problem for a $100 million company that's partnering with us on this, all the way to building a growth company that now has 35 people in Canada and is chugging along, and this is only 18 months old. And we're not the only ones. There are lots of players in the world that are starting to see this opportunity and investing heavily on it. Regrettably, not as much in Canada as I would like. Uh, when, I, when I moved to Canada in 2010 and set up Tandem Launch, um, and I went around and said, you know, we're gonna build an investment operation, we're gonna build companies, we're gonna invest in consumer electronics. People said, consumer what? Literally, I had to give talks to explain what the field is. Here I am explaining a trillion dollar industry. Uh, but because from an investment perspective, it was unheard of, right? This was before the, you know, the world of wearables, internet of things and all this kind of stuff. Today, last year, in fact, 2013, you see the little spiky graph there. In 2013, venture capital investment in consumer electronics has outpaced and outdistances mobile apps and e-commerce together. That's the future, ladies and gentlemen and hopefully we'll all be there together in Waterloo as being the leaders. Thank you.